This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate the invitation to talk with you today. And what I'd like to focus on is mitigating wildlife damage and cropping systems. And I'll talk about some basic principles of wildlife damage management, whether you're dealing with birds and mammals. Uh, I also want to go through results of a survey uh, we did a few years ago to give you a sense of the magnitude of the impacts that deer and other wildlife cause in New York State. Uh, so we'll dive right into it. I think Dennis Slate summarized integrated wildlife damage management pretty clearly at a conference several years ago, and it comes down to a very simple process. You can kill them, you can scare them, you can put up a barrier, or you can spray a chemical that may or may not work. And that's integrated wildlife damage management. Now we can all go home. So but it's really, you don't have a lot of options when you're dealing with most of these critters, and they can cause significant economic impacts. There are some keys I've seen over the years in multiple species, multiple cropping systems uh, that tend to lead to success in an integrated wildlife management program. First, most important is timing, knowing when and where the damage is going to occur and making sure you get up your control strategies, whatever you choose to use, out in a timely fashion before the damage gets too severe. Once wildlife develop a feeding habit, it's really t difficult to break that. But if you can sort of know that, hey, my blueberries are starting to get uh, turn in color, the sugar content's going up, I better get my netting on now. Before those birds start feeding, uh, you can have more success. Diversity is important. You've got to know what different tools and techniques are out there. And sometimes combining tools work, sometimes it doesn't. I'll share some data with you about that. Persistence is really important. This is not something you do once and walk away from. To be successful, most of the uh, tools and techniques we have require continued, often daily attention in some cases, to moving things around, filling gas generators to make sure you've got electrical power uh, to electrical powered unit or making sure your batteries are up on your solar powered units. And then monitoring. You gotta know what's working, when and where, and is what I'm paying for wildlife control benefiting me? Is it worth it? A lot of times, on particularly some bird data I'll show you uh, later on, it probably doesn't pay for what most of the growers are doing for bird control, except in certain uh, conditions where you've got low crop yields. Most wildlife leaves signs of the presence, often easy to identify who the culprit is. Like, for example, if you can see the deer tracks up where the, in the corn ears, or deer damage to uh, apple trees or nursery crops are, are really easy to identify uh, because deer have lower incisor and upper hard palate. They don't have upper and lower incisors like rodents, so they don't leave a clean bite. When they bite on something, they leave this ragged, torn edge, so it's usually pretty easy to identify deer damage versus rodent damage. I mentioned the survey of deer damage to agriculture in New York State. I uh, partnered with Tommy Brown and Dan Decker, folks with the Experiment Station Farm Bureau a few years ago, and we wanted to estimate deer damage by crop type and region. We wanted to look at how growers were using uh, DEC deer damage permits that are available to help them alleviate crop damage. And we wanted to compare what the magnitude of deer damage is versus other wildlife damage that they're seeing on their farms across the state. So we used a database, uh, a farm maintained by Ag and Markets, the uh, New York Ag Statistics Service, and developed and implemented a mail questionnaire uh, to 3,909 farms across New York State. Uh, we targeted 500 per agricultural region. We ended up with uh, 909 because there weren't 500 farms on Long Island. There were only 409, uh, so we hit all the farms on Long Island. Our sample pool was 25,497 farms across the state, and uh, to meet our criteria, a farm had to have at least $1,000 in reported sales, and we included all farms that were not exclusively like bees and honey aquaculture. In other words, you had to have a, a field crop growing of some type that wildlife like deer could potentially damage. We got a fantastic response rate uh, compared to most mail surveys nowadays with about a 50% response rate. We got 1,927 questionnaires returned, so we think we've got really uh, good data, at least old data, what the impacts were. Uh, we also followed up with a phone call to 100 uh, non-respondents to look at uh, how, did their damage differ at all from those 
50% of people who returned the surveys, and we found that by far the non-respondents had less damage and smaller acreages farmed. So uh, based on a formula, we down uh, uh, adjusted the raw damage reports by 31.5% to account for the uh, non-respondent bias in the survey data. So again, these are probably relatively good statistics given the sample size that we've got. You're probably familiar with all the New York State ag regions in New York State. I'm going to show you a few tables. And so data are broken down by agricultural region, and you'll see there are some patterns that emerge. In terms of total number of farms and sales, again, from that pool of 25,500 farms, roughly 60% of the farms reported values and sales between 10 and 250,000. Uh, no big surprise there. What was interesting, uh, if you look at the proportion of farms that reported more than $250,000 in sales, the highest percentage by far was on Long Island with one in five farms reporting more than $250,000 in sales. And the lowest percentage was in the southern tier with only 8% of farmers reporting more than $250,000 in sales. And the big farming regions are western New York, uh, southern tier, and central New York. Again, no big surprise there. We looked at total estimated damage uh, by deer that was reported by the growers, ended up being almost $59 million a year statewide. So we're talking about a fairly substantial economic impact to the, the farm industry in New York State. By far, uh, in terms of acreage and reported damage, 23% uh, of that total was uh, in grain crops, or $13.6 million in losses. If you look combined uh, alfalfa and other hay crops, You've got another 24%, another $14.5 million in losses. So if you take grain and hay crop, you're looking at about half the total damage in the state come from those three crops. So it's, again, a significant e economic impact for those farmers. And then you can even get down to the specialty crops, things like grapes and berries. are still in, you know, one to $2 million a year in losses from wildlife. We look at it regionally, break down the statistics. By far, Western New York, has the highest uh, uh, amount of damage with over 20 million. And then Lower Hudson Valley, uh, southeastern New York, has the second highest percent loss with uh, a little over $14.5 million. And again, those are our primary agricultural regions in the state with some of the better quality soils, lots of farms, lots of uh, cropping systems there. Trying to relate that back to deer density, uh, it's a, you got to take this a little bit with a grain of salt. But generally in western New York, where the highest damage is, you see the highest deer take. Uh, a lot of these uh, wildlife management units are averaging 9 to 16 deer taken per uh, square mile in the wildlife management unit. So you've got very high deer densities here that overlap with high crop densities and valuable crops. Doesn't hold quite as true in Lower Hudson Valley, a little bit lower harvest rate, but the issue in the Lower Hudson Valley is you've got a lot of suburban development. Even though there's a pile of deer there and there's a fair amount of damage occurring, a lot of those deer aren't accessible to hunters because of suburban sprawl and suburban development. So the average deer take per square mile is lower, but that doesn't mean there's necessarily fewer deer there. And then not surprising, the lowest den deer densities in the state are in the Adirondack ecoregion. And uh, so you tend to see more uh, lower levels of deer damage in northern New York because you're generally there, you're just you know, maybe averaging uh, less than 10 deer per square mile in some areas up there. We asked growers on the survey, uh, what species were, what are the top three species on your farm that are responsible for wildlife damage and how much is it costing you? And 83% of the growers across the state listed deer in their top three species, and we attributed almost half of the total wildlife damage that occurs statewide caused by deer. So hence, we put a lot of focus on deer and deer management in our program. 30% of growers listed turkeys, about 15% of the damage was related to turkey. 21% listed geese, 20 groundhog, 15% raccoon. So this is sort of the hit list. These are the species that are responsible for most of the damage in agricultural situation. I listed turkeys and geese specifically. I'll talk a bit more about birds in general in sort of the uh, second half of the presentation. So what does Department of Environmental Conservation do? They've got responsibility and authority for deer management across New York State. Unfortunately, most of the laws and regulation are written for managing deer at broad scale, landscape scale, at the state level or the wildlife management unit. That's 
deer tags or uh, doe tags are issued based on an estimated number of deer in a specific wildlife management unit. When it gets down to farm level impact, there's really only two things that landowners have available, the deer management assistance program and deer damage permits. And those are designed to be landowner run programs and I'll talk a bit more about each of those. But uh, by far and away, most of the effort in the state is at this level, which really may not help growers that are down at the individual property level. We ask growers, well, do you allow hunting on your farm and what type of hunting do you allow? And not, so no big surprise, 83% of growers across state do allow deer hunting on their farm, but uh, two thirds to three quarters only allow family, friends, and neighbors that they know. That's been very consistent in many state surveys that people don't like strangers on their property. They want somebody that they know and they trust if they're hunting deer. And that may not, those folks may not take enough deer to have any real impact on crop damage. Only 30% of farmers allow strangers to hunt. Uh, for the 17% of growers that don't provide any hunting access, they cited problems with uh, liability and past hunter behavior. Most farms don't restrict sex of take of the deer taken, and that's an issue I think we've got for education. If you're going to have impact on crop damage, if you're going to reduce deer density, you really got to harvest a lot of female deer. That's the growth potential of the herd. If you don't take female deer and you just shoot buck, that herd's going to continue to grow because the, the does are the ones that are producing the fawns every year. Only about 9% of growers require that some does be taken on their farm and uh, opposite that, 6% of growers only allow bucks taken. They don't want you to shoot does, which doesn't do a thing to help with crop damage. We ask growers, are you aware of the deer management assistance program DEC has and have you ever used those type of permits? The way the deer management assistance program works is the farm landowners uh, fill out an application with DEC usually in September and then DEC gives the landowner additional doe tags, antlerless deer tags, for use by hunters on their farm during the regular open hunting season. So what they're doing is encouraging hunters to come onto the farm, take more female deer, hopefully reduce population growth, and hopefully consequently deer damage. Only 31% of growers who one responded to our survey were even aware that this program existed. And, uh, but of those that applied for permits, uh, on average, they got seven and a half permits per farm and killed 5.6 deer per farm. So again, those folks that get the permits do pretty well at filling them. And uh, uh, you'll see that growers uh, feel that these do help some in alleviating damage. The other type of permits, what's called a deer damage permit. Growers were more familiar with deer damage permits. Two thirds said they had heard of them, but only 12% applied for them. Uh, deer damage permits allow for a grower to kill deer, usually antlerless, sometimes buck, outside of the normal hunting season. So let's say you're a strawberry grower and you've got deer coming in in June that's just hammering your crop and you're afraid you're not going to get your crop out of the field. You can apply to DEC for a deer damage permit and shoot those deer during June if you want to or any, any time of the year outside the normal hunting season. Also with a damage permit, you can shoot at night. You can use lights. You can use bait to attract deer to a safe shooting area. You can do all sorts of things that you can't do with hunting that you can get written into a deer damage permit. We have been using those the last three years here on campus to try to alleviate some of our problems. Uh, 50, what? Is there restrictions on who is allowed to use those types of permits? Uh, you've got to be a licensed hunter. Uh, having passed a hunter certification course, and you have to be at least 21 years old. Those are the only two things uh, you that... Have to be a farmer, yeah. You don't have to be a farmer. And in fact, sometimes farmers will get the permit, you fill out a form of who your designated agents are when you apply for the permit, and you can have non-farmers, hunters, friends, who are licensed and meet the requirement, come in and actually do the removal on your farm. You don't have to be the landowner. When the application is submitted, you list your agents that are going to do the shooting. Most farmers don't have time to do it. A lot don't do it themselves. They did, you know, use their designated agents. On average, again, uh, about eight and a half DDPs were obtained per applicant, and seven deer were killed. So again, most people are filling these permits if they apply for them, and they feel they do some good. So just sort of to summarize the survey part of this, uh, deer damage to agriculture in New York State is really important. It's a high economic impact, particularly in western and uh, southeastern New York. Uh, grain and nursery crops were the two highest, but if you had hay in there, you've got substantial forage crop losses. Most growers allow hunting, but 
Uh, most growers don't put any restriction on the sex of deer. And I think, you know, if we're talking with, with farm audiences and we talk about deer damage, we got to encourage those farm landowners to, to take more female deer. Uh, the growers who used either the DMAP or the DDP program, 79% of those growers in the survey said they thought they were at least somewhat successful in trying to reduce their agriculture problem. Will they solve a problem? No. They're not going to solve a problem, but it might uh, get you through a cropping season. For example, if you've got something like strawberry with a very, very narrow harvest window, uh, intensive use of a deer damage permit for a week or two might get you through that harvest period where you can get your crop out of the field. What do I recommend to growers? If you've got perennial crops and you're in a high deer damage area, things like uh, tree fruits, uh, nursery crops, uh, eight foot high fencing is the only thing we know really works well. Expensive, six bucks a linear foot installed on average. So you can spend thousands of dollars on a deer proof fence, but we know that works if it's done properly. Electric fences do work in some situations. I like to go with a baited electric fence on a single strand of poly tape or poly wire, get a good high voltage deer charger, something that's going to put seven to 10,000 line volts out over the, the line. You can either use the peanut aluminum foil tab of peanut butter as a scent attractant, or I prefer using cloth strips with a deer repellent. Some type of odor in addition to the electric enhances the effectiveness of the electric fence. The way the peanut butter works is the deer smells that peanut butter when it approaches the fence and it touches the fence for the first time with its nose or tongue and gets 7,000 volts through its nose. That's a pretty good negative conditioner. They don't fool the fence again after that happens usually. And the same thing with the repellent. They start to associate that repellent smell with the electric fence. And so sometimes, oh yeah, I can smell that. I'm not even going near that thing. Uh, but again, the limitation on electric fences is that they have acreage size limits. They tend to work pretty well for small fields, small blocks, under about five acres in size. Uh, sometimes five to 10 acres are pretty good, but usually above 10 acres in size, deer will figure out that, oh yeah, I can jump over that thing. And if there's something good to eat inside, you know, they'll learn that behavior and the electric fences will fail eventually. Well, I'll talk about, a bit about bird management and some general bird management principles. I was part of a collaborative project with Catherine Lindell from Michigan State University and my grad student Heidi Hendricks. We had a USDA NEFA Specialty Crop Research Initiative project funded to look at multi-state impacts of birds on fruit crop uh, in several states. Our partners, uh, again, were Cornell and Michigan State. We sort of led the program and did uh, the, uh, a lot of the field work. We have partner uh, universities in the Pacific Northwest and their fruit growing region out there with Oregon State, Washington State, and Trinity Western, and uh, folks from the USDA National Wildlife Research Center in Colorado, Fort Collins, uh, were involved in some of the survey design and uh, uh, discussions on, on techniques to use. Lots of different types of bird deterrents out there, everything from the old scarecrow to the aluminum pie plate you might see in somebody's backyard to raptor models, scare eye balloons, mylar tape, all these things may or may not do any good. Really depends on, on your cropping system, but yet growers depend a lot on these type of devices to try to reduce bird damage to crops. Basically just uh, sort of a general rule of thumb, my experience with the, the hawk and owl model is that they tend not to work at all. I mean, it's just a given that the birds really figure out pretty quickly that these things are plastic and they're no real danger. Uh, small areas, we've seen some success with uh, bird distress collar devices uh, on small areas on certain crops. Uh, you'll see some of the data I'll show you in a few minutes. They're not particularly encouraging, but we uh, occasionally they work. The mylar flagging in the upper right, that's just a highly reflective flag. That's tended to work pretty well on some field crop situations, particularly with migrating geese, not so much with resident geese. They've sort of figured that out. Netting, some people consider a permanent fix. I have my question, the way netting is done, how well that really works. Shooting can be used in limited areas, very site specific, whether you can or can't. And the same thing goes for trapping, say starlings around a dairy farm where they're causing contamination of food and stuff. Sometime a limited trapping effort can do some good. Our project objectives are looking at things that influence an effective bird damage management strategy. 
And so we had one uh, group in the Pacific Northwest and at the National Wildlife Research Center that was looking at economics to try to qu quantify cost of bird damage to producers, consumers, and how it affects regional economies. We're still sort of in the data analysis and writing stages on that part. We had another group of uh, social scientists that was looking at consumer habits and marketing. Again, those data are still being analyzed. We hope to get a paper out here on that fairly soon. And then we had a group of us looking at the biological side of things, uh, landscape and edge effects, bird species and behavior, and uh, effectiveness of different management strategies. And the last two are the things that we're uh, farthest along on. I want to share some data with you today. We asked growers as part of the uh, survey in all those uh, states in the New York, Michigan, and the Pacific Northwest, what works and what doesn't, in your opinion. And you can see very clearly, most growers feel that the only thing that really works is netting. They claim netting is very to moderately effective about 80% of the time. Everything else along this axis has effective rates of 50% or below. Most growers have tried these things over several years. They realize, well, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, uh, but they continue to use them. So again, we wanted to get some really hard data on how well these different devices work for scaring birds. We had uh, field research sites in New York, 96 uh, unique farms where we collected data in central and western New York. We did bird damage assessments, looking at percent damage to missing fruit. We looked at edges versus interior blocks. Some growers claimed that all the, all the damage is on the edges. Well, is that true? We took a look at that. We did intensive bird surveys to look at what species were present, what's their foraging behavior, and then we had 52 additional farms in Michigan that did the exact same protocol. So we could combine data from New York and Michigan on the same crop, same year, same time, and do comparison to how things, well things worked in two different states. In terms of damage assessment, we broke each block or field up in the five strata, north, south, east, west edges, and then an interior stratum. We selected uh, for trees or bushes in terms of blueberries, 12 randomly selected uh, trees or bushes per stratum, one randomly selected branch per tree, and then counted all intact missing or damaged fruit. Uh, and we looked at sweet cherries, honey crisp, crisp apples, um, uh, blueberries and Pinot Noir uh, wine grapes, so we did four uh, focal crops. On grapes, because they're on trellises, our setup was a little different. We had a random height and a random position along the vine. We pick a, a random height and, and position, and then we pick the cluster closest to wherever that random height position fell out, and we count all the fruit on that cluster. Again, damage missing intact. Additional data we took for each farm, and so again, location, or their presence of telephone wires nearby. A lot of growers say, well, it's those darn wires, the birds get up their perch, and then they go down and they steal my crop. We wanted to look, do telephone wires really have an impact? Other bird management techniques, surrounding land cover, uh, some uh, folks say is, you know, it's that dairy farm next door attracts all the starlings, and now they're over here eating my blueberries. Well, is that true? Uh, so we've got good data on uh, land cover characteristics around that still being analyzed. And look at number of plants, each strata, height, and any special additional data or notes we wanted to take while we are in the field. In terms of observations, we use standardized point counts. Two observers, 15 minutes in the block, counting all the different bird species that they saw. We did it both on the interior of the block and the exterior of the block. We did foraging observation. Uh, we did start with stationary, where positioned uh, the observer where they could see on the edge and end of the block and just watch for an hour. What, what birds do you see? Pick a focal bird, follow as long as you can, record all the fruit it touches, eats, consumes. And then we did uh, moving observations, where sometimes it's difficult to see what's going on in a block, particularly with tall cherry trees. And so we had observer just walk slowly, find a focal bird, follow it as long as they could. Uh, when that bird's gone, find the next bird, follow it as long as you could to get focal observations on who, what they're actually eating and damaging. We look at the sweet cherry data. Uh, what really jumps out at you is the percent fruit loss in both sweet cherries and blueberries was highest in 2012. You guys remember what happened in 2012? What's that? Nope. What else could affect it? Yeah, late spring frost. 
Ninety percent of the cherry crop, sweet cherry crop in New York was lost in spring 2012, a late spring frost, and a big chunk of the blueberry crop was lost. So one of the general principles is if you've got less fruit on there because it's a bad year for whatever reason, drought, late freeze, then those are the years you've got to pay attention to bird damage because when you've got a low crop load, the percent fruit loss goes way up. And we saw that in 2012 in more normal cropping years. We didn't see a whole lot. Very little damage in apples, even though apple growers were saying the birds are eating our fruit, the birds are eating our fruit. When we go out there and measure it, we don't see a whole lot. In fact, uh, we, did, we only did three orchards in uh, 2014 and saw zero damage. We didn't see an ample damage by a bird. Wine grapes tend to be the most consistent. You know, we're seeing about uh, 3 to 4 percent loss per year in Pinot Noir wine grapes. Blueberries, again, and sweet cherries, you get good and bad years. Again, depends on the crop load. We looked at, again, the position uh, to see what growers were saying was true, that edges get more damage in interior, and we definitely don't see that trend in any of the crops. It just looks like inside and outside get damaged pretty much the same. The only pattern that we saw was interesting was we saw more damage on the north and south end of blocks and wine grapes. So why would that happen? What's going on in wine grapes that would increase bird damage on the north and south ends? What's that? Absolutely. It's the orientation of the trellises. Most of the vineyards are oriented north-south parallel to the Finger Lakes because they're on side slope. That means the open end of the rows are on the north-south side. That's where you get your most intense bird damage because it's easier for them to get in the road from the north and south end. But besides that, we saw no pattern based on uh, position in the orchard. We looked at distress collars and hot kites uh, as an effigy. Uh, raptor effigy. These are very commonly used by growers throughout New York and Michigan. Uh, they think they do some good, so we want to see, do they really do any good at all? What can we measure? So we uh, group uh, uh, farms into four clusters of four. So in that cluster of four, you'd have a, a block, uh, say a sweet cherry block with a distress collar, a sweet cherry block with a hot kite, a sweet cherry block with both devices in the field, and then a control block. And uh, our criteria is all those farms had to be within 30 miles so they're in the same population of birds because the birds are very mobile. We selected farms based on the previous year's damage, so we tried to pick farms that had about the same percent loss and similar block sizes. We set up the devices two to three weeks before harvest, and we positioned them at least four rows into the block. And if we had both deterrents on a, on a block, we set them up on opposite sides from each other. And so then we actually collect the data to see how well these things worked. We move, also moved them once a week. Some people say moving a device adds an element of surprise and increases effectiveness. So we switch positions of devices once weekly. And what we found was uh, these things didn't make a bit of difference. It was unfortunate. And in fact, the damage was highest where we used both devices. <laughs> and so again, growers think these things work, but they are wasting a lot of time and money. If you look at the control block, except for this one uh, unusual uh, New York farm, actually the controls suffered slightly less damage than the treated blocks. And uh, there was no significant difference uh, when we did the stats test across there. It just made no difference whatsoever putting these things up in, in uh, sweet cherries. We also came across the idea of using air dancers. And you might have seen these at the used car lots, these sort of silky things that are air powered and wave around. And we thought that, oh, these things got motion, they're big, maybe they'll scare birds better than some of these other devices. Uh, so we set up sight pairs again with the same criteria. And we had uh, one farm with a dancer, one farm without a dancer, within 30 miles, based on the previous year's damage and block size. Again, two to three weeks before harvest. And we moved the dancers every two to three days uh, around the field. So you can see sort of the pattern every couple days, it'd be in a new spot. We had to either, these are electric powered fans. You have to run them by either an electric cord, which we didn't have in any cases, or a gas generator, which means that the grower had to go out there every day and refill the gas generator because the generators had run about eight or nine hours and then they'd run out of gas. Uh, but they, growers are willing to do that. We looked at sweet cherry damage and what we saw with the dancers and sweet cherries, a slight 
benefit, not significantly different, slightly less damage. You still see lots of farm to farm uh, variability. And uh, again, that's very typical with bird damage. That's why you got to do a lot of farm. If you do one or two farms, you're not going to learn anything. You got to be doing five, ten farms to get some sense of what works and what doesn't. Blueberries, again, uh, slight difference uh, uh, with the dancers, had about 6% fruit loss uh, on the dancer plots, a little over 8% control. We look at berries loss per day, that was marginally significant at 0.05, so again, slightly fewer loss, but at those type of differences, it doesn't justify the cost of running the things or putting it out in the field of blueberries. Where we did see a difference was wine grapes. And uh, uh, what we saw was uh, about half the level of damage where we had dancers and wine grapes, and it was significant at the 0.01 level. So these things appeared to work relatively well on wine grapes during the first two years. Still a lot of farm-to-farm -farm variability, and it doesn't work everywhere. Here you can see on this farm in Michigan, the, the dancer plot actually had higher damage than the control. Why? Said, we don't know. But again, you just see tons of variability. In New York, we had more consistent results with the air dancers, and I think a lot of that has to do with field size. Our blocks uh, where we were running this, our grape vineyards are tended to be smaller on average than where they were in Michigan. Our blueberry fields also in New York tend to be much smaller on average than the typical Michigan blueberry field. So where you have smaller blocks, smaller sites, uh, these devices are more likely to benefit you and work. We uh, did a, a comparison between dancers and control and uh, in 2014 and used two dancers per site. You can see how highly significantly different, except for farm A, everything was highly significantly different. So these devices really did work uh, on the wine grapes and the growers have talked about it. We had one grower had a naming contest for his device out by his vineyard and his customers named him Mr. Pino. And so that's what he called his device. He thought it was a big deal, a little bit of marketing with it. We looked at other variables related to bird damage. And again, the, the telephone wires kept coming up, but we couldn't see anything significant in cherries or grapes. And when we looked at blueberries, actually the blueberry fields that were closest to the telephone wires had less damage. And the reason we think is that those tended to be much larger fields, so the damage was more dispersed. And so there's good, no strong relationship. And again, when we looked at netting, in paired plots where we had dancers and no dancers, in both areas were netting, there was uh, no significant difference. And so what we're seeing is birds are getting through this netting with this larger mess size. Uh, we've seen that on Long Island for years. The birds are using the netting for a perch, and then they poke their heads through and damage the grapes through the netting. So the growers are using a lot of netting, spending a lot of money on it, but we didn't see it significantly really reduce the bird damage. So who are the culprits? Uh, these are the common bird species we see in, in fruit orchards in New York and Michigan. And one of the take home messages I want to leave with you is just because you see a bird there doesn't mean that's the bird that's causing the damage. And we've got data to back that up now. We look at sweet cherries in 2014. The most frequent sighting by far in terms of number of birds were American robins and European starlings were number two. We looked at birds taking and eating fruit. American robins were number one, and number of fruits consumed American robins were number one. That lines up pretty well. But we look at time spent eating fruit, European starlings, even though they're the second most frequent bird, they don't eat a lot of fruit. And with cedar waxwings were number two in terms of eating fruit and feeding on, spent time foraging on fruit. But yeah, we didn't see very few cedar waxwings in the vineyards, but they do a lot of damage. So again, growers may be missing the culprit in these cases uh, because they're smaller, less visible birds. We saw similar patterns in blueberries. Again, the most frequent bird we saw in blueberries were American robins followed by Baltimore Orioles. But when we looked at time spent eating fruit, American robins ate very few fruits either time or fruits consumed, they were almost dead last, even though they were the most common birds seen. It was the Baltimore Orioles and the Cedar Waxwings again that spent most of the time consuming the fruit. So I see this with growers a lot, uh, particularly with turkeys too. They say, well, the turkeys are damaging my, my vineyards. Well, we really didn't see turkeys taking grapes. It's just because they wander through and they're big and visible, the grower thinks that's what's causing the problem, and it may not be. 
What we found is that in our tr field trials in New York and Michigan that the hot kites and distressed collars and even the combination two really didn't do anything. And past studies had pretty missed results too. We did find though that the dancers showed some optimistic uh, results in grapes. And uh, in fact, we had a couple of our cooperating grape growers that wanted to buy the air dancers from us after the end of the trial. They, were, they liked them so much. Uh, they do take intensive management. You've got to either have electric power or you've got to be out there, like I said, moving them around, filling that gas generator every day to keep the, the windsock up and running. Nets didn't significantly reduce bird damage that we saw in the dancer site pairs. And uh, we actually saw slightly lower bird damage uh, with blueberries related to the telephone wires. But again, all the sites with wires tend to be larger blocks. I think they just had less damage in general. Not, Nothing really related to the wires. So I just go back to integrated wildlife management. When you're working on farms or working with a farm owner, it's really important to assess everything that's going on. What are the species causing damage? Which crops are affected? Uh, how many acres? What time? What's the housing density? What are your neighbors like? A lot of these sound devices, neighbors don't like them. And uh, so again, if your farm's more rural, you might have more options available to you. And then you've got to go through, you know, what can I afford? And I would argue that in most years for at least fruit crops in New York, it doesn't pay to do any of this stuff except for maybe air dancers uh, and wine grapes. But if you get that bad crop year where you've had a late freeze or you've had a drought and the yield is low, you really need to do something. That's the area you want to do your bird management because uh, it's going to have an impact on the percentage of fruit that you might save. Let's see. It's important to reassess too. If things don't work, why? What can I do differently? Is there something else I haven't tried? What other op options are available to me? A lot of these things, the growers put them in the field and they walk away from them and they just assume they're working. But if you don't assess, you don't know. And very few growers go to the trouble of actually looking at fruit damage and, and actual loss. Just want to share a website with you, uh, wildlifecontrol.info. There's results of all sorts of extension publications for different species if you're interested in that. And also, uh, we'll eventually get uh, more data from the, our research projects and links to papers and stuff up as uh, we get more of it written up. Uh, but I appreciate everybody's attention and be glad to answer questions folks may have. Yeah. Thanks a lot, a lot of, a lot of good information. Um, you know, your early maps showing kind of where most of the economic damage, as you point out, that matches up with where the farms are. Mm -hmm. But from a farmer's perspective, you know, I'm just curious if you've looked at the data in terms of damage per farm or per field, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we haven't really looked at it all at all on a damage for a field basis or the way growers react to it. Obviously, you know, if you, getting a relatively small fields that are high value and a lot of your income's coming. And if you've got wildlife damage, it could be more economically painful, that's for sure. Uh, but we really haven't looked at into that in any detail at all. We looked at the sort of the broad trends, broad statistics. Um, it's, it's really interesting that the dancer method worked well with the language. Mm -hmm. And you had some species information for blueberries, yeah, that's a really good question. We did try to collect bird species information for the grape, but when we did our foraging observations, both the stationary and mobile, we found so few birds foraging there. We, we saw birds, but we actually saw more flyovers than anything else, birds that really never uh, fed. And so we had zero in terms of foraging observation in grapes. Uh, so again, the damage was relatively low compared to the other crops, and that may be another reason why uh, the air dancers tended to, to work better there. Are this kind of not right on the agricultural end, but I see managing Kennedy East up there, and I know that's a real challenge for a lot of communities and fancy industrial complexes and everything else, and they seem to be hanging out more and more and more. Mm -hmm. What's the, like, the elevator sound bite on the future of managing Kennedy East and whether they're going to just become more and more common year-round or what? Yeah, the, what we call the resident or the local breeding goose flock, uh, it's plateaued now, but it plateaued at a really high level. I mean, it's 
or tens of thousands of birds what we want, above what we want in New York State currently. Uh, if you go back a couple of decades, there were more what we call the migratory geese, the ones we all grew up with that breed in Canada, winter in the Chesapeake, North Carolina. Uh, but about a decade and a half ago, that flip-flopped. And so now they're actually more resident birds in the eastern flowery, local breeding birds, than migrants. And they cause all sorts of problems. And they are short-distance migrants. They do migrate, but only when they have to. So they're the ones that breed locally. They're here pretty much year-round as well. They need two things. They need open water, which they have on Cuga Lake year-round, and they need grass. So the only thing that's going to drive them out of here is if we get enough deep persistent snow that they can't forage, then they force to go south until that snow melts. So they're here most of the year. We've got a pilot goose project in Stewart Park right now where we've been using uh, uh, the uh, town of Ithaca goose committee wanted to use only non-lethal devices and I said told them right off well don't expect a whole lot from non-lethal but uh, we were able to at least move birds out of Stewart Park using uh, uh, firecrackers and radio control cars we got them out of the park <laughs> and uh, but they didn't go far they went to the inlet and cast park which we expected <laughs> what's that it didn't terrify the park users. We tried to do it at times a day, very early in the morning, very late in the evening, not during the middle of the day when there are a lot of park users. And so we'll be putting together a report for the uh, city of Ithaca here soon on the goose efforts. They really need to start earlier in the year. What we learned, we banded 425 geese and collared 200 adults in Stewart Park this summer. So if you see a goose wandering around Stewart Park with a big yellow collar, that's one we put on. And what we learned was that most of the geese that caused the problem in Stewart Park in June and July are not local uh, breeding birds. We only found about 10 to 12 pairs that actually had gosling, a total of about 60 gosling uh, that were produced in and around the park. The rest of them are what we call local molt, molt migrants. There's so much water and grass around Stewart Park, it's a perfect molting area. When they molt, they drop their flight feathers for five weeks and they cannot fly. So birds come in and they look for places like Stewart Park where they can fly in, drop those flight feathers, just sort of hang out, feed, defecate everywhere, and create all sorts of havoc for five or six weeks until they regrow their flight feathers. In late July, they're on off again somewhere else. Uh, but we've got to live with the mess during that, that midsummer when the park's got the highest use. What the town and the city need to do is move those birds out before the molt. They didn't do it. And so that's one of the recommendations going to be before they drop their flight feather, that's when you need to do the intensive hazing and non-lethal stuff to try to get those birds out of there, get them to molt somewhere else. And then instead of having 450 geese in Stewart Park in late June, hopefully we can get it down to maybe 40 or 50. <laughs> Any other questions? Paul, I was going to ask a quick question about wild boar. I know for a Mm -hmm. time we did have them in New York yeah. it looks like they're no longer here but can you say something about them because they can do a lot of damage right? yeah we're fortunate that uh, DEC Ag and Markets and USDA Wildlife Services saw the, the wild boar issue starting to emerge and we did have some localized breeding populations in New York there was up, in the, up on Cortland on Onondaga County line one in Tioga County uh, one up in Clinton County in northeast New York and one on the Sullivan Delaware County border and uh, uh, USD Wildlife Services staff got a contract to come in and do eradication and uh, USDA and DEC staff really did a good job. Uh, essentially we've eradicated breeding wild boars from New York. They still get escapes every now and then and there's new legislation that's passed that uh, farmers can't keep wild boar on their farm. I think it was as of last summer if I remember right. And so hopefully that will eliminate chances of seeing wild boars in New York in the future. Uh, Pennsylvania, right across our border, still has wild boars and shooting preserves, and they escape. That was the source of the Tioga County population, so we're still going to have to deal with that occasionally. Any last questions? You mentioned that uh, a lot about what farmers can do to protect the entity here, but I'm also curious, are there any um, state programs, for example, to uh, sterilize deer or do things where populations can actually be I know that's a controversial Yeah. Yeah, we've actually done research on campus with deer fertility control and sterilization, and we found after about six, seven years of effort, the best we could do was sterilization. Even combining it with our campus deer hunting program was to stabilize the herd, couldn't reduce it. And so that's when we went to our deer damage permit and started actually removing animals at night over bait, and we were able to cut the herd in about half in two years on a damage permit. 
And uh, other places have seen that. We did a, just finishing up an experiment in the village of Cuga Heights. Uh, this is the fourth year. The first two years, they couldn't get approval for shooting. Uh, so they hired in White Buffalo, a contractor. And uh, we worked with White Buffalo and using Cornell veterinarians. We sterilized 99% of the female deer in the village of Cuga Heights the first two years. And what we found was that having that high proportion sterilized for two years, the population dropped by 30%. There wasn't enough immigration uh, to replace the, that lack of fawns. And then the village got approval for a deer damage permit, a kill permit. They contracted with the white buffalo to come back. In the last two years, uh, white buffalo's actually done deer removal with uh, crossbows at night that was approved by village police. And so with the two years of removal, now they've dropped it another 40%. So they have 70% reduction in deer in the village of Cuba Heights right now with that integrated program. Question is, will they sustain it? It's a deer, doing deer management is like mowing the lawn. Guess what? It comes back. You got to do it all the time. You can't wait a year. If you, if you just you know, give them a two, three year break, guess what? They'll reproduce you. They'll be right back there. And you lose all the, all the gains that you made. All right, well, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.